to the Pseudo Show brought to you by Tux Digital. Today we start a series around multi-cloud with an interview with the CEO of Mist.io. All that and more on the Pseudo Show. Pseudo Show. This is Brandon. First, before we get into the show, some housekeeping. I really appreciate the feedback from episode 51 called Giving What We Can. I still haven't picked an open source project to donate to. I would appreciate help picking a project. Please go to the episode 51 episode page and post some recommendations. There'll be a link in the show notes. I may put out a poll on Twitter or Mastodon with the finalists. Second, I will be on vacation the week episode 54 is supposed to drop. I'm working on ensuring that it gets out on time. However, if it does not, it will release the following week. Now that's out of the way, today I'm joined by Chris Solstice. Chris is the CEO of Miss.io. Chris has been on the show before on episode 18. If you aren't familiar with Mist, Mist is an open source cloud management platform. I republished the video I did explaining the features of Mist on the Pseudo Show YouTube channel. Make sure to go check it out, and while you're there, make sure to get subscribed and hit the notify button so you get notified when I release new episodes of the Pseudo Show podcast and Pseudo Show Labs. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash tux and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the Pseudo Show and Tux Digital. This episode of the Pseudo Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Head on over to do.co slash tux2022 to get started with a $100 credit. DigitalOcean has a comprehensive portfolio of compute, storage, database, and networking products that put your cloud infrastructure in capable hands so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most, building world-changing apps that grow your business. Predictable pricing, robust product docs, and services that developers love get support at every stage of growth with simple, powerful comp cloud computing. Get growing at DigitalOcean. As a listener of the Pseudo Show and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. In fact, it's better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you sign up at do.co slash tux2022. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of The Pseudo Show. Chris, thanks for coming back on The Pseudo Show. I really appreciate you making the time. Good to see you again. So since we last spoke last year... I feel like a lot, a lot of things has changed in the uh, multi-cloud space. There's been further consolidation of tools. There's been a push to bring workloads. I went maybe not necessarily back on prem, but definitely closer to the edge of the cloud, so that they're closer to the uh, to the users. As a result, enterprises are modernizing on-premise infrastructure just to handle those edge workloads they're moving some workloads to other clouds either in the big five so aws azure gcp ibm and oracle or the term that i've seen running around is the alternative cloud such as uh the sponsor of the show DigitalOcean, and others like linode equinix and vulture either because of costs or they're closer to where the workload needs to be based on what you're seeing and what your experience uh, in this field what is driving what it, is it that locality that is driving enterprises to go multi-cloud or is there some other uh, driver 
for 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 this uh, change. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there are many reasons uh, for uh, for this. We we have seen it as well. Uh, workloads are moving closer to the end user. You can call it ads. You can call it on prem. You can call it you know uh, however you like, but. The, uh, the end result is always moving closer to the end user. And this is something that we've been expecting, to be honest, at some point. Uh, as uh, people were gaining more uh, experience with uh, operating uh, in a cloud, as like the operating model, not like the, the public cloud, uh, and with the popularity that certain private platforms have gained, like Kubernetes, for example, or you know, OpenShift and all these things, uh, we were expecting that at some point people will start moving this experience of operating in a cloud model from the public cloud somewhere else. Uh, and this somewhere else is, you know, all over the place, <laughs> practically. Uh, and so and the reasons for, uh, for that vary, but they're pra practically the same that they were uh, when, uh, the, when organizations started adopting uh, multi-cloud. It's now they're just doing it in a, let's say, better way and more self-conscious way uh, than before. So, like, the main uh, reasons uh, remain, uh, you know, legacy, acquisitions, mergers, or just teams of people that are feeling more confident with Azure versus VMware or vice versa. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of uh, legal reasons you know, keeping some workloads under a specific uh, jurisdiction uh, can be really important in some verticals. Uh, but there are also uh, cases where people just try to use the best tool for the job. You know, if I need like a huge bare metal, uh, why should I buy that from AWS instead of Equinix Metal, for example, or something like that? So... Uh, getting the job done <laughs> is is the main concern. Now, infrastructure and where this infrastructure is, it's kind of a secondary uh, issue that you need to tackle. So, yeah. So, it sounds like to me that it's mostly about that workload locality, maybe even data locality, make, make sure specifically if the data needs to be within a certain jurisdiction, like it needs to be within the EU. Or, or a specific latency, like, uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, 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 that's the locality needs to be within, yeah, yeah. like, yeah. five milliseconds of the end user, you know, whatever that, exactly. whatever that case may be. Where are those workloads going? It seems to me that AWS is no longer the first choice because we're seeing, like, hyper growth, like crazy hyper growth with Azure. And yeah. Google's growing either organically or inorganically. It just depends on which region we're, we're seeing them in. And then the, or the, and the alternative clouds are growing like crazy as well. Like Linda just got acquired. Uh, DigitalOcean seems to be growing. It's, it's going everywhere. <laughs> That's the bottom line. I think like ado adoption is growing like crazy. Uh, so it's not just that people are moving workloads. It's also that they're growing existing workloads uh, across the board. So maybe, you know, we've been running everything on AWS and something really small in Azure, but now these new workloads uh, that we want to spin up are ideal for Azure. So why not put them there? Uh, so it's a, I think it's a combination of two things. Like, first of all, adoption is still growing really quickly. Uh, and then you also have... Uh, people moving from uh, one uh, provider to the other, one vendor to the other. Now, the, the movement is very chaotic to actually make sense, but we have seen also uh, some very, very strong growth for uh, Azure uh, in, the, in the past few years. AWS is certainly not the de facto choice anymore. And uh, the, all those uh, smaller, smaller clouds, like you said, like these, those alternative clouds, uh, are also gaining a lot of uh, traction because you know their their model is much simpler and it's a much simpler service to understand and operate, which makes it ideal both for new users but also for experienced users. The model is easier to consume for smaller uh, enterprises. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you can just uh, open the calculator and that's it. You're done. You uh, you did your projection. Yeah, it's that simple.
in terms of multi-cloud, what kind of architectures are you seeing? Are they mostly siloed environments? Or are they or are enterprises trying to connect the clouds any way they can? Like whether that's like with a direct connector with VPN tunnels. We see them more on the siloed side, let's say. Uh, people treating their clouds as islands and uh, spinning up specific workloads only on a specific v uh, 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 cloud and not, you know, spanning across cloud, which I think is is probably the best option uh, right now, uh, given the complexity of setting up a uh, multi-regional multi setup on AWS. Now imagine trying to expand that across multiple clouds. It's, it, it can be done, and in some cases it makes sense, but you know the, the majority of the use cases are not, uh, uh, do not require something like that. So uh, we see the people treating all those uh, different environments as cloud, as different silos, as islands, but we also uh, see a need for centralizing the management for all of that. Uh, so you know you know exactly what it is that you're running on cloud A, B, C, D, uh, etc. Uh, and then another approach that we lately are seeing is uh, some sort of what we call Russian doll cloud, <laughs> let's say Russian doll deployment or name it as you like. Like, for example, you know, you're getting a bare metal, you're uh, spinning up uh, KVM, then Kubernetes on top or, you know, VMware and then uh, OpenShift on top or, you know, all sorts of uh, crazy combinations. And the bare metal layer could also be coming from a cloud, like from AWS or uh, Vulture or uh, whatever. So we see this really nested situation where uh, uh, people are usually trying to make the most out of the infrastructure they have and uh, specifically for CI, CD, QA, testing workloads. We see this nesting a lot happening uh, also lately. Well, we're doing it ourselves, by the way. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's the main things that we're seeing at least. It probably hasn't changed much since we last we spoke. The main challenge that I'm seeing for multi-cloud is not necessarily management, it's cost containment. Management is still obviously a problem, but the big problem that every enterprise is having is keeping that, their costs down with uh, any cloud provider. So anyone can just go in with a corporate card. <laughs> what do you see enterprises doing to do that cost containment? Is it just pushing centralized tooling and forcing everyone to go through, or is there some other mechanisms that's, uh, that, that they're implementing that maybe we're not, maybe I'm not saying I'm not in that space anymore. This kind of depends on the size of your bill, to be honest. <laughs> if, if, if the bill is rather, uh, like on the high side, the easiest thing that people are doing is specifically with Azure, uh, but we've seen that with other public clouds as well, is like pick up the phone, call your account manager and ask for a discount. That's like <laughs> step one. Uh, like no technical work required, no nothing. Just pick up the phone, call your account manager and ask for some credit or uh, like some discount. Uh, so that's like step one, like easy win, no technical work. Uh, step uh, two uh, would be to, you know, actually try to uh, figure out where you're uh, spending a lot of money, if this spending is justified or not, and then try to uh, work through that. And that's, that's where, you know, actual tools can uh, help you, uh, help you with. Uh, and then finally, there is like a more proactive approach, which we are big fans of, uh, by the way, you know, instead of uh, allowing everybody to go and spin up a new account and charge your credit card with like a crazy uh, S3 backup uh, that they forgot running or something like that uh, is, you know, somehow proactively control who can do what, where, and what's the budget for that even before they get started and, you know, set some automation in place that can clean up and use the resources and things like that. So the, so depending on your uh, situation, all those options are on the table. It's, uh, and, you know, you certainly have to use them all uh, if you're looking for the, the optimum uh, and the best outcome. We, we've been kind of alluding to this uh, through, through this conversation. Workloads are moving closer to the end user and... 
latency requirements are driving uh, architecture decisions. Typically, this is edge architecture. Really, I just see it as an extension of cloud in many in many ways. It's an extension of the existing cloud architecture. But how do you see edge impacting either existing cloud infrastructures or how people think about cloud infrastructure architecture going forward? Yeah, so I totally agree. It's an extension of the cloud, right? Uh, but I, I mean that as an extension of the cloud operating model, not as an extension of AWS. So, you know, Outpost, for example, is not exactly, uh, doesn't mean that's just this Outpost box is ads and that's it, period. Uh, or, you know, whatever other, uh, other providers are doing, like with Anthos or Azure Arc or whatever, you know. So these are part of the solution, but they're not, the ads themselves and like the important thing here is to work with this new whatever infrastructure you have uh, somewhere close to your end users as if it was a cloud and uh, yeah that's like beyond vendors uh, let's say um, so uh, I think that this move will certainly continue and especially with the rise of 5G and the relevant applications we might even see new players in the field like, you know, obviously telcos, for example. Uh, I have this place where I'm running a small data center for my 5G antenna. And if you, Mr. Application Provider, need uh, like the best uh, latency, then, you know, you have to get a server inside that data center. So uh, I think that we're going to see a lot of changes across the board, like from the hardware level and how you create new data centers, let's say all the way up to the software stack. Like, for example, you know, is Kubernetes good enough for Edge or not? Uh, and if it's not good enough, you know, uh, what is good enough? And uh, what is even better than good enough? So I think this will drive a lot of changes across the board. And, you know, we will, we will see a lot of interesting uh, stuff happening in, uh, in the short to medium term, let's say. I think we're going to see more lightweight solutions come out. Kubernetes is pretty heavy. They may be based on Kubernetes. We'll, we'll see. I'm watching MicroShift with uh, great interest, uh, which is an experimental. Obviously, there's K3S and others that are pretty lightweight as well, but I'm interested in OpenShift for uh, at many, sh MicroShift, excuse me, for many <laughs> for obvious <laughs> reasons, <laughs> uh, as I am hoping for that, that seeing those smaller footprints that make more sense for the edge, as well as improvements to zero touch provisioning and big changes in automate in the automation space. Yeah, 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 for sure. They, 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 all of those will be. Uh, will be will change uh, driven, but but by what happens on the underlying layer. So uh, there's going to be like a big shift there as well. Uh, but I think the bottom line, at least uh, from our perspective, is that things will become even more complicated, even more uh, heterogeneous, and people will uh, need to feel more uh, comfortable with uh, running those. Uh, uh, more heterogeneous setups, uh, let's say, because, you know, the public cloud is not going anywhere. There's still a lot of things that make a lot of sense to do there. There are still a lot of things that make sense to do in this rack you bought like five years ago uh, in your office uh, instead of, you know, spinning up uh, instances all over the place. And uh, then you also have ads. So now, you know, you want with, you went from one platform to two and to three and maybe even the four and then count the staging environments and dev environments and then you know it, it can quickly get out of hand so uh i think this is what we're uh, we will see in the very near future and you know people need to prepare about that because it's coming yeah speaking of man managing all this i want to quickly touch on the miss product just give the listeners a quick update I, I remember what prompted our original conversation is i created a video around mist and then that was discovered i don't remember how you guys discovered it at the end of last year mist 4.6 was released is there any any highlights from that that you want to go over or like how, how it improves the 
your the multi cloud experience for we have a lot of things uh, coming up uh, with uh, 4.7, which is about to be released in a couple of weeks. Uh, depending on when this airs, it might be <laughs> it might be already out. So I will talk more about that. Uh, and uh, the big uh, new thing that we're bringing right now is management of uh, managed Kubernetes services uh, like uh, GKE, uh, EKS, uh, things like that. Uh, so these types of services have become kind of a you know de facto solution for running kubernetes on the on a public cloud uh, so these these will sit along our community kubernetes uh, support as well as uh, red hat to openshift which uh, are already available since uh, the previous version 4.6 uh, but uh, more importantly we're working on like our big next uh, stable uh, release uh, version 5 which will bring many changes in uh, behind the scenes, let's say, uh, but also in front of the scenes. <laughs> uh, the biggest uh, new ch change will be a brand new API. We're uh, redesigning our, AP our RESTful API from scratch, make it much simpler for end users to, uh, to use it. Like one big trend that we've uh, seen recently is that people are adopting MIST in order to integrate it with something else, like a bigger, system that needs to support some sort some sort of multi-cloud environment so we're uh, putting a lot of work on the api together with the uh, new api we will also have a stable release of our brand new cli so you know you can perform all these things that you can do from our web ui from your command line uh, the you can you can already preview the cli it's it's mostly working uh, so it's rather stable already. Uh, and then, you know, besides all that, uh, we are also working on some major changes on the UI to improve performance. Now that we were talking about, instead of hundreds of servers, about thousands of containers, now the, the, the browser needs to keep up somehow. So uh, we're bringing a lot of changes on the web front end as well. And, uh, and finally, uh, there, uh, there is going to be, um, as obviously, you know, all the, the usual round the buff, bug fixes and things like that. Uh, one thing uh, that's uh, interesting uh, as well is how we're streaming the output of uh, different uh, scripts and uh, tasks. So you will be able to uh, get feedback from running your scripts automatically or manually uh, in real time through MIST um without having to share any credentials besides you know with our platform um, and that's it um and uh, at the same time like on a community side uh mist is all you know it's been open source since day one uh we're using the apache v2 license but we are also working on some things there to uh to make it even more uh, friendly like for example we're replacing elastic search with uh, open search uh and the next big step, like not for five, but for six and on, will be to also replace MongoDB. Uh, so, yeah. Are there any changes to the policy engine? I, I think in inside of MIS, it's you know it's called rules. There are several additions there. Uh, so we have uh, fully rolled out with uh, four point six, uh, what we call MIS constraints that are practically. Uh, extending our team's uh, section with uh, things like uh, budgets, expiration dates for resources, and uh, a lot of uh, provisioning policies. You know, for example, don't allow people to provision extra large instances or just allow them to provision medium-sized instances or small-sized instances, and several other modifications that uh, practically allow the administrators of MIST for your organization to uh, to provide to their end users, their engineers, their developers, a more streamlined uh, provisioning uh, process. So, you know, instead of having to choose through like 10 or 15 fields or whatever, uh, you can just choose a couple of ones, click OK, and that's it. This is something that happened in 4.6. On the automation front, I, from my point of view, extends in the policy because typically policy is going to probably call some sort of script at some point. Is there 
any additions to to the automation like beyond bash scripts and ansible uh, now we are practically supporting pretty much every executable out there so you can you know upload your python script or your uh uh Perl script or uh, whatever so we support our wide range of executables ansible is still there it has been extended as well and that's uh, already available by the way yeah and like uh, with v with v5 something that i forgot to mention before is that we will also be uh introducing integration with uh, hashcorp's vault uh for uh for storing your uh for storing your secrets you can either bring your own if you already have it, and then you know choose which secrets you want to uh, to use in your uh, in your uh, environments through Mist, or uh, you can just get one that we're we're shipping. So uh, this is another major change that will uh, affect pretty much everything. That's good. Vault's uh, becoming prolific, and I swear it's getting integrated into just about every product out there. So I'm not, yeah, I'm yeah. not too surprised about that. It's, it's a great product. We're, we're practically using it already. Uh, so yeah, and we've been using it for uh, several years and the entire team at HashiCorp is uh, pretty amazing. So uh, we've been uh, working with them for some time now and we will be releasing that with the upcoming uh, V5. Great. Chris, any uh, final thoughts before we wrap this up? No, I think uh, that was uh, really interesting. Uh, thank you for uh, hosting me. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. I, I, I just because I was debating on bringing on a, a, one of my guest co-hosts and just having a chat about it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to email Chris. Chris uh, is going to have some thoughts on this that is definitely going to be interesting. And oh, when you're living in the management space, and it's something I haven't been in now for a couple of years. You know, I've been mostly in the Cooper you know, get the Kubernetes out there space. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> since I haven't been working on uh, cloud forms anymore since that, but that's, uh, anyway, I, I do appreciate the, uh, uh, the conversation and is missed, uh, hiring. Yeah. We are always hiring. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we're, uh, looking for, uh, uh, and engineers, uh, both on the, the front end, the back end, uh, as well as like more full stack. Uh, so, uh, if you, if you like go Python, JavaScript and, uh, multi-cloud, then, you know, let us know. Thanks, Chris. Thank I appreciate the uh, conversation and, uh, I hope to talk to you again real soon. Thank you. so much for joining us today as always your feedback is welcome head on over to pseudo.show slash discuss if you'd like more of the pseudo show you can find it over at pseudo.show and on social media at pseudo show podcasts you can catch more awesome content over our network partners at tuxdigital.com you can support the show on patreon at pseudo.show slash patreon and make sure to get subscribed on youtube and go to pseudo.show slash YouTube. There'll be links in the show notes. You can follow me on most social media at dbrandonjohnson or my website at open-tech.net. Thank you for listening to the Pseudo Show, where business meets open source. Until next time.